So our next guest, we're just going to make a quick transition because we are running a little bit behind time, but we're going to give him the proper respect, is uh, Dylan Valley, who is, uh, you guys know him, he's an Africa's a Country board member um, and an award-winning filmmaker and lecturer at the University of Cape Town. And he, um, actually, I think, oh, I think well wrote, well wrote that this man is prolific. I'm just repeating it, Dylan, you are prolific. Um, um, and what brings him on today is that he is the creative advisor for Black Women Disrupt the Web. Um, and I'll, I'll ask him about it in a minute. Black Women Disrupt the Web is a global competition to produce an original web series showcase. The call for entries aims to attract proposals from Black women, writer directors from Brazil, Colombia, Kenya, and South Africa for three three-minute episodes providing perspectives on the theme imagining black futures. Can you say a little bit about that, Dylan, about the history of this, like how this came about? Um, and just like how we, and tell us a little bit about it, because I know it's a competition, like where we are in the competition right now, um, et cetera. But start maybe perhaps in where does this idea come from? Who's involved? Just so people can get an idea about it. Okay, thanks. Hey, Sean. Hey, Will. Great to see you guys again. And welcome, Sean, to the motherland. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have you back. So, um, yeah, so Black Women Disrupt the Web um, essentially um, came out of a discussion that um, a friend and I had, uh, Zakia Carl Johnson, who's our partner in this project. And uh, Zakia has an organization called Black Women Disrupt. And um, I have been doing this research on web series um, in my academic work and looking at how uh, web, black women were basically using web series as a way to overcome industry gatekeepers. And, um, you, you know, I was actually at the beginning of my research, I was kind of looking at web series more broadly at this form, but through the, the, the work, I realized the most groundbreaking uh, web series were actually being done by black women because black women have traditionally been marginalized in uh, film and television. So. The mo so the most um, kind of st standout web series were usually done by black women, like um, *The Adventures of Over Black Girl* by Issa Rae, which uh, through the creation of that became um, *Insecure*. You know, HBO is *Insecure*, and so there's different examples of this. Issa is not the only example. Um, and so through this discussion, we decided to, to partner up. Um, we met through this fellowship called Atlantic Fellows for Racial Equity, and um, Atlantic Fellows also uh, gave us the seed money to start the uh, project. So shout out to Atlantic uh, Fellows for that one. And so um, so that was the, the beginning of, of this idea. And we decided why not commission uh, five web series. I'd already been doing this as a class at Bits. So shout out to my web series class. I hope you guys are watching that. <laughs> and we, we, we had kind of already piloted this idea and made three times three web series and so on. And so we decided to do this with five web series from around the continent, uh, from around the continent, and also in, in South America. So there's two, uh, two countries in, in Africa, two countries in South America, and we're kind of looking at um, you know just focusing on the work of Black women and seeing you know what kind of uh, web series they'd be interested in making. And it, in a way, it was kind of just a um, a, a way to to channel. Uh, energy into the work of black women and also like the, the resources that we had. And, um, and so where we are, at the, uh, the phase we're at now is that all the web series are basically done. And on Saturday, we have a live showcase on Quaily TV. Um, by the way, thanks also to Africa as a country for the support as coming on as a partner. And so uh, we will be showing um, We'll be showing all the web series on Quaily TV. So if you haven't heard of Quaily, basically a really great st streaming platform based in the US that's looking at um, Africa and the diaspora in terms of the content uh, the content on there. So it's like Netflix, uh, but for black content, basically. I would put it. <laughs> and, and so so it's really great. I recommend you know getting a subscription, but also just check out um, the showcase. So we'll be showing all the web series on there, and that's where we are at the moment with the with the process. I wanted to ask a question about the web series as format. You were talking just now about how black women really pioneered 
the web series as a cinematic format. What do you think it, it is about the web series which presented an opportunity to people who are foreclosed from traditional formats, from being able to tell their stories? And what do you think it offers as a format that other traditional forms don't? I mean, I'm thinking back to the conversation we had when you were last on the episode, uh, and that was a conversation about Netflix and its influence in Africa. And we were having a little bit of a debate there about you know the obsolescence or not of the auteur filmmaker. When people think about um, cinema in Africa, they will always think about these giants um, who were auteurs. And as you pointed out then, which I thought was a valid thing to point out, the majority of them are men. But now thinking back, uh, thinking now to the contemporary moment, uh, the people who are pioneering this new format are, are women. So can you talk a little bit more about uh, about web series and what drew you yourself into your research into the web series? Yeah, so yeah, that's a great question and I hope I'll be able to answer it well. But basically for me, um, the reason why web series has been so uh, successful in, in, you know, like highlighting the work of people who normally would have been marginalized like black like women from the TV is because of its kind of amorphous form. There's no one right or wrong way to do it, um, especially uh, around the time when Awkward Backer was getting made, so around, you know, just after 2010, so around 2013, 2015. Um, and basically it was this new, it was new idea, this new form, which had actually been around since the 90s. But um, it's the, because of its kind of amorphous nature, People were able to make up with what they wanted to. There was no, there's no one telling you what to do, how to do it. Um, and I think that people at that time, also uh, with YouTube was kind of coming of age, people were also turning away from uh, mainstream television because there weren't shows like Insecure on TV at the time. Um, and now we're in a context where, especially in the West, there's like a plethora of um, what we could call like African American content, and also um, that's obviously spills over to the rest of us because of the way in which these kind of global cultural pro products flow. Um, but at the time, there was really what uh, Issa even put like a dearth of black content on television. So um, in that context, there was flourishing of, of not only. Um, of black content on, on, on the web, but also things like um, shows that were, you know, queer and, you know, things that you wouldn't see on TV. And I think the internet is important, is an important space for that kind of thing. The internet should always be a place where you can see stuff that you wouldn't normally see on mainstream television. And I think that um, in different ways, we've seen how um, the internet has actually influenced mainstream television. Uh, not the internet just as a, as a, as a thing in itself, but the, the people who are making cultural products on the internet who were normally shut out of uh, traditional media. So um, I hope that answers the mm -hmm. question. I mean, I, I was going to, just as a follow-up on that, I think it's interesting that you and I, I wanted to get to the films that are the, the finalists. But one of the things I thought was interesting about what the web series on YouTube allows when you said something about the diversity of the content. For example, Awkward Black Girl, I think is much more kind of somebody who is, I wouldn't say like lower middle class, but sort of working, who is, uh, who, who, who doesn't have a necessarily like a, so, a really secure job. I think she's like a temp. And most of her friends, they seem to, they, they sort of seem to live on the fly. Whereas with Insecure, they kind of set it in a much more uh, kind of um, aspiring, more glossy black middle class. When it got to television, like once it got to HBO, to, to your point about the kind of variety that you get with web series and you get on YouTube, I think it's interesting that that's the contrast. I think Inse so Insecure, when it got to HBO, when, when she got to HBO, it got more glossy. I think that's my sort of sense. I'd be curious how you, what you think of that. Um, Maybe answer that first because I want to see if you disagree with my comment on that, and I want to ask about the the the, the films for the finalists. 
Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, insecure is, in a way, it's completely different to Oka Black Girl. Um, and I think, you know, um, I just have to say kudos to Issa Rae, though, for managing, managing to keep kind of the spirit of what she was trying to do alive. Um, even though Insecure is very glossy, I think they were they were able to create something that still was very authentic and true to the to her voice. And she was able to kind of own her voice. And I think also by that point, to be honest, she probably moved on from uh, the kind of humor of Open Black Girl and you know, YouTube humor. And she knew that in transitioning to television, she had to do a little bit more. Like you couldn't just do like the same kind of short form humor and kind of more slapstick stuff wasn't necessarily going to work for a whole show. So, so um, one thing that did happen though, I mean, the making of, in the run up to the making of Insecure was that different networks were trying to get her to change her idea all the time. And so it took a few years to actually be able to make something that she felt comfortable with putting out there because. Um, in one of the interviews, she was saying, like, you know, the, she would meet with the network and they'd say, we love everything about the show that, you, that you're pitching. We just want to change the main character. Mm -hmm. Like, we don't want you to play. We want to get somebody who's light-skinned. We want to do this and that. Um, and she had different versions of this conversation over and over and over. So um, in, the, in, in the end, HBO were the ones who kind of gave her the, the best kind of creative freedom, which allowed her to, to make what she wanted to make. But, I think it's. I think there's also like a progression in terms of our own artistic voice. I would say, but it was it was definitely the the her background in web series which allowed her to to get there because she she didn't start with like she had been making web series and had been on the grind for quite a long time for years actually, and uh, Awkward Black Girl was the web series that like gained all this attention from people like Pharrell and other celebrities. And, um, and so, so yeah.